Well, thanks guys for uh, showing up tonight. Um, got several presentations, but I, I want to start and allow uh, have uh, Chuck and Peter talk about uh, ASIM and our calendar. So yeah, go ahead and take it away, Chuck. Yeah, it would be more Chuck than Peter, unless Peter wants to jump in. But yeah, so everyone knows that um, um, Rick Spieling has been doing the calendar for six, seven years now. I forget how long it's been, but it's been quite a while. And he's done an excellent job, but he told me that he can't do it and that his time, he doesn't have the time to do it going forward. And so what we're looking for is to get some volunteers to help with this. And Peter and I have talked, so we want to be involved with it, but, you know, and I want to be involved with it more from the point, I just want to document it, everything that needs to get done not really do it if I don't have to, but I'm willing to do anything that needs to be done. But looking for folks with experience, working with photos, working with, um, it's probably Photoshop is probably what we're using, Dan, you think? Um, but you know, what, whatever the tools are, and then, you know, how we do whatever we need to do to get it published, I can tell you who we've used as the publisher the last couple of years, and it's been different ones. Um, but just hoping that this group, uh, we can get a volunteer or two to kind of help guide us through this. And between us, we can uh, work through this as a group. Not looking for hands to raise tonight, but would like before, say, the next uh, digital SIG meeting, if someone is interested to reach out to me or reach out to Dan and just let us know. And then we can set something up. Yeah, from what I understand, I think Rick is going to give us all the templates he's used in the past. Um, I believe he's used Photoshop. I'm not 100% sure. He was kind of secretive on what he did. Uh, but I believe he's going to give us all the information he's used. And I think he's more he's more than willing to take the time with us to help us with it, to explain what he's done. And, but we really need someone from this group to to join in and help because you guys are the guys that take the pictures you know what you're looking at and you know what looks good what's not going to look good and things like that um it's not as simple as like cutting and pasting things and you guys all know that because you've printed out pictures and the challenges with making them look good in print is uh is is going to be a learning process that uh it took uh rick a while to do so like i said we're, we're we need someone from this group someone or someone's to help um so if you're interested reach out to me or reach out to chuck uh, and our hope is i think chuck's hope is too is that we get this we start it sooner sooner than in the past in the past because uh so that uh, it gets done much sooner and it's not a, as big of a struggle to deal with at the end of November or December. And it, it would definitely help us get them out by Christmas and things like that, right, Chuck? Absolutely. My my goal is, is to have volunteers and have everyone set up, I'm gonna say by the end of February, March 1st, so we can start going forward. I did ask Rick to do a knowledge transfer. It sounds like Dan's done the same thing. I have not heard back from him, but I'll reach out again. But, you know, once we get uh, the group, the volunteers together, then we can do that knowledge transfer. We can figure out what our game plan is to go forward. But I would love to have the calendar set and sent to the publisher by the end of August. And oh. if we could actually get them back before the, the picnic in September, I think that would be fantastic. Because that'll give us, you know, several months to go through and actually get those out in time for Christmas. And some of us, myself, uh, Don Ladwig, our treasurer, we've talked about whether, you know, going to some of the malls or some of the stores and see if they would sell them for us. We'd like to, you know, kind of get and get some um, more exposure out there through retail if we can. It's less about the money and more about the exposure for the group. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of my off the cup plan and we just love for you know some of you guys to really jump in and help out and there might be more than one area you know one would be actually doing the calendar 
And there might be a whole another area just picking the photos. Because the way you were talking, Dan, you know, you got to, it's not just looking at the photo, this is pretty. It's like, you know, what's, what kind of photo is it? You know, what's, what's it, how's it created? Um, so, and that's way outside my realm. I can tell you if a picture is pretty or not, that's it. Yeah, I can, I, I, I'll tell you real quick, one, one thing that I think we're going to have an issue that's a good issue to have is we have so many good, we have so many imagers in this group that in the past it's, it, it's been a little bit of a challenge to fill it. Okay. And it's not going to be a challenge going forward. So yeah. uh, we, we might find that we're putting more, more photos in there, more per page and things like that. So um, it's, it, it's, it, it's going to be good to start it earlier this year too. Yeah. And that is a good thing. I think the more, um, different people we can get to have photos on the calendar, I, I think the better. So, yeah, I agree. Any questions? Mike, I can certainly help there. Can't lead it, but I can do the more mundane tasks like data generation, stuff like that. All right. So I see GM. Who Who is that actually? <laughs> Don't is recognize the voice, huh, Is Chuck? that Grant? Yeah, it's me. Yeah. I, I didn't recognize your voice until you started laughing. There you go. All right. Thanks, Grant. So if anyone else, you know, would like to help out, like I said, reach out to Dan, reach out to me uh, via email or, you know, however, and, you know, we'll, we'll start taking names and we'll come up with a game plan here in the next month or so. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jax. Thanks, uh, Peter. Yeah. Okay, Mark, uh, you want to go ahead and take it away with your presentation? Uh, sure. Um, Dan and I have been talking about um, <laughs> mosaicing and um, I've been doing a lot of it, so I um, uh, just thought I'd walk through the tools that I use in PixInsight um, to uh, uh, create the mosaics. Can you see my screen? It's got the PixInsight images and stuff on it? Yes. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to walk through, th there's there's a bunch of tools in PixInsight. Um, well, there's a bunch of tools built into PixInsight under the process menu, um, like gradient merge mosaic. And there's some things that you can do with image registration, if you've ever played around with it, um, that has options in it for... Um, doing mosaic registrations and i i tried doing this you know registering images for a mosaic and then using the, the gradient merge mosaic and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work um it doesn't do well with gradients uh and it doesn't do well if you've got a bright star right on the line where your two frames overlap it has a tendency to uh, they call it splinching which i think is a word that they got from harry potter uh where it just kind of blows up on one side and disappears on the other side um so uh, i started using a set of tools that are in under the script menu in mosaic and specifically mosaic by coordinates uh, trim mosaic tile and photometric mosaic that are supplied by um, a third party. Let me open the Word document. This document, by the way, I posted a link on the um, groups.io forum it's got this word document and these images in it um so you can get all this information 
uh, the mosaics, those mosaic scripts, they've 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 kind of come and gone as being part of the standard PixInsight release. Currently, I don't think they're part of the standard PixInsight release, and you have to add them in as a third-party script. And so uh, you just add it in as a repository, you know, under resources like you do for anything else. And that's the website address that you use for the repositories. And it'll download and um, install those script processes. Um, there's a really good Atom Block tutorial on all the various different settings and everything that you can use for scripts. Uh, so I put that in that Word document too. So um, go out and look on the, the groups.io for a link to a folder. And the four images that I'm using tonight to do the demo um, will be out there. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about before showing you how to do a mosaic is talk about planning mosaics. And I'm just doing this because the first couple of ones that I tried to plan came out where the overlaps were like in the corners of the two frames. I didn't do a good job. I didn't have a good feel for what the rotation of the camera was. And the camera that we're using doesn't have a rotator on it anyhow, or the telescope doesn't. Um, and I found this tool called, uh, it's under there, called uh, under the script mosaic, called Mosaic Planner. And it allows you to go and enter all the information about your um, system up here under System Geometry. You enter the focal length of your telescope, the pixels and the pixel size of your sensor. These, these numbers here are for a AS... I 6200 full frame camera. Um, and it'll show you, you can tell it how many rows and columns you want for your mosaic. And you can, you can change those, add rows and columns. Uh, you can control your overlap and you can set your rotation of your camera. Uh, if you know it, if you don't know what your rotation of your camera is, uh, and you don't have a rotator, uh, one of the easy ways to do that is to just go to the uh, plate solve for it. And it tells you right here what the rotation for your camera is. And you can, if you need to add 180 degrees to that to get uh, a number that's, or add 360 to that to get a number on the other side of zero, uh, you can do that. So let me go back to the script again. The thing that is interesting about when you're planning mosaics is um, the mosaics are cocked relative to each other in when you move in RA. And you'll notice that like this pair of frames, the north is up in this image that I've I'm planning on. And so pairs of frames that are above top uh, uh, on top and below each other are all lined up. But ones the, the pairs that are side by side aren't because when you move in RA, your, your horizontal is actually a curved declination line. And so the center of the image or the, the rotation of the, the image ro rotates a little bit when you move around deck. So, I mean, if you think of, if you were trying to mo make a mosaic of uh, 360 degrees, on a single line of declination, it would be a circle with the North Pole in the center, okay? If you just put a whole bunch of images side by side without changing the RA, 
and only changing the deck, I'm sorry, without changing the deck and only changing the RA, you would end up making a mosaic that's a, a circle when you look up in the sky. And so that's kind of what that's representing. And this tool takes that rotation into account, which uh, from what I've found, some of the other mosaic planning tools don't take that into account, particularly the one in Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, they just lay all the frames out as if they were perfectly square to each other. So this one, this one does work that way. Now there's supposed to be an option in this tool that allows you to uh, tell it to adjust the rotation so that the frames actually will be square to each other. But when you turn that on, it goes crazy. And I, there's a problem with this script that whatever the calculation it's doing under that, where it's supposed to adjust these so they're all square to each other, but it doesn't work right. So I just leave it at fixed tile rotation. And you can enter your rotation of, of your camera once you get it off of the solver or unless you know it already. When you get done, uh, you can select to write the data out to a comma separated values file, basically write the center coordinates and rotation values for your four frames in this case. The thing that it needs in order to run is a plate solved image of the area that you want to take a picture of. Um, Dan has got some some ways of extracting um, uh, images like that from the, is it the Hubble archive that you go to? He sent me a script to do it, but I just kind of go out and look on the internet for an already existing image of the area that I want to do a mosaic of, download it, plate solve it, and then run it through this tool. So. If you're ever looking for a mosaic, a tool to plan your images for doing a mosaic, this is a pretty good tool. And the things that you need to know, again, are, you know, all this information about your scope, which you normally need. Uh, you need to know what the rotation of your camera is. And then you can go in here and play around with the various settings to see what the frames are. And, and the reason I'm showing you this is that I tried to do this sort of thing within Sequence Generator Pro with an image that Sequence Generator Pro downloaded from someplace, I don't know where. Um, I think they do some kind of a composite image from uh, the Sloan Digital Size Sky Survey or something like that, but it didn't show, it, it didn't show everything that was in the area that, that, that I was trying to image. And so I, I lost some of the feature that I was trying to view because I, I couldn't see it in the image that Sequence Generator Pro downloaded and I ended up making my mosaic too small. Um, and so this one I think works a lot better, so. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, when, when you pull the images from the surveys, I believe Nina does that and some of the others, and I do that, they typically only pull like the red plate or the blue plate, or they do some quasi put together with them. And those those tend to work fine with galaxies, but when you're talking nebula stuff like this, you're not seeing the whole picture. Um, so you really need to go out there and look on Astro Ben or something like that and find an image of what you're what you're trying to get, like he's saying, um, or else you might frame it wrong. Right, exactly. That's what we did. The the image that I got from SG Pro, it wasn't it wasn't this particular nebula, but it was a nebula that had a whole bunch of other stuff down here that I couldn't see in the image that SG Pro downloaded. And so I didn't cover that area with a mosaic when I when I framed them when I built the mosaic. Plus, SG Pro doesn't have these this rotation through change in RA in it. And so the images I got were I thought were going to be square to each other, but it turns out they were actually rotated like this. And if you know that's going to happen, then you can 
you can play around with it using using these arrows over here to move your mosaic pattern around so that you get everything that you want. Uh, I would just I would caution two things when you're planning trying to plan for a mosaic, and again, you can't do enough pre-planning for a mosaic. There's no such thing as doing too much pre-planning for a mosaic because uh, getting the images right is the, the the biggest issue with that. But um, I would say always make sure you've got a lot of excess area around the target that you're that are it that's inside your mosaic because you're going to end up flipping some of these images because of these little slivers that aren't overlapped okay and your your final image is actually going to be a lot smaller than the full size of this mosaic and so you know if necessary take another row of mosaic uh if you need to or or change your overlap a little bit i i would like I mean, I think it's probably a good idea to keep an overlap of probably at least 25% for a mosaic, uh, maybe even more, because it gives the mosaic uh, composition processes more to work with if it's got more common area uh, in the in the frames that it's trying to put together. So. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I would say. Make sure you got plenty of room on the edges around your target within your mosaic and that you keep your overlaps uh, as high as you reasonably can. Any, anybody got any questions about that part of it? I got a question for you. It might be a dumb question, but what if when you select adjust tile rotation and slide the rotation slider that doesn't adjust it nope yeah adjust tile rotation it just doesn't work there's a whole thread in pix insight okay. about this okay. this particular feature just not working right okay um and I, they don't have an answer for it yet it's still under investigation so it would be nice and it, it it's really not i mean it's really not saving you that much uh it's more of an aesthetic thing to where uh, the this pair of frames and this pair of frames rather than being at a different angle to each other slightly would be squared off to each other but from a standpoint of processing i don't think it really matters a whole lot uh, it might make it a little bit easier to get for you to get some some buffer zone around the outside of your image uh, to make sure that you're not going to end up clipping off something that you need. But I don't think unless you got a, a really huge mosaic um, that it's going to make a whole lot of difference. And to tell you the truth, trying to do more than a two by two starts getting into severe issues uh with being able to merge all of them together um gradients are different gradients and different uh sky background in the different frames is a big issue with trying to put the images together and the the more images that you try to fit together in your mosaic the bigger the problem that's going to end up being so I mean, I personally would really kind of shy away from doing anything more than a two by two. Um, there's people out there that have done it. Um, there's that project that Pix Insight just started recently called the Mars Project. It's got to do with finding what the background is all around the sky, 360 degrees, so that they could do it in. And, and use it for doing mosaic processing, uh, but that's just getting started. Hey, Mark. Yes. Kind of a stupid question from a newbie, but can you do a two by two of two by twos? That's what this is, a two by two. This is right, four right. images. 
Right. And you were saying uh, more than that gets a little bit like a three by three. You could if you wanted to. I would to to do to show you that I'm going to change the the focal length so that the images are a little bit smaller. Okay. Um, I, where I was going and, was and, and and you can do that. There, that's that's a three by three. Right, 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 right. But you said more than two by two offers uh, difficulties. Right. And I was wondering, well, what if you have four two by twos? that you can stitch together to create a four by four. You follow what I'm saying? You do it. I understand what you, I understand what you're saying. The problem that you've got is you're going to be taking images over multiple nights. Right. Um, uh, in yeah. multiple different conditions uh, with multiple different sky conditions, right. multiple different seeing uh, values and you know, the software okay. can only be so smart to try to gotcha. figure out what really should be there for that image, you know. And if the stuff in your upper right corner is wildly different because it was taken a month later than stuff in your lower left corner, okay. you can end up with. So what you're saying really is your images for the two by two should be gathered in like one night or under exact same conditions? We, we did a really successful two by two and we did it in... How long did we take to do that SH2240 two by two, Joe? Maybe a week. Oh, well. At, at most of, of imaging. And, um, but it was all in around new moon. It was all moonless nights. And it was in New Mexico where, where we don't have much in the way of gradients anyhow. So, so the weather conditions, the viewing conditions that would have affected a large mosaic a two by two of two by twos wasn't present when you did your original when you got your original data for your first set of two by twos then right i, okay. I well i mean it, we had we have probably the op imaging down there in new mexico especially on moonless nights is probably the optimal condition for doing any kind of a mosaic much okay. less one of of more than two images um and um, Dan, I, I mean, Dan has told me that he doesn't even try to do images in St. or mosaics in St. Louis just because of the problem with varying different gradients and sky conditions. Is that right? Yeah, I tried one or two, and even with hydrogen alpha, I would get gradients that would cause major issues. Um, the the other the other caveat on this is that you guys are doing it with a refractor that's less prone to seeing issues. Huh. Whereas your focal length gets longer, the seeing issues become more of an issue and um, it gets more challenging, just exponentially more challenging. I think you could probably do two by twos, but I mean, I mean, to tell you the truth, uh, getting a scalp, getting a telescope with, um, uh, what half the focal length is and doing it all in one image is way easier than doing a two by two mosaic. Yeah, it took me, it took me two or three years to do a two by two mosaic of the California nebula from here. Ah, oops, sorry. So uh, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks Mark. The more images you got in there, the more chances you have of having a screwy background that's not going to merge in with the rest of them. Oh. And and in fact, we even tried to do that in that that image that I was talking about where I clipped off a little bit at the bottom. Joe and I actually tried pasting in two more images on the top and two more images on the bottom. The two images on the bottom that we, we wanted to add to the two by two that we already had came out okay. The two on the top, I never could get to merge in with the rest of the mosaic, wow. and that was from 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 even from down there in New Mexico. So, uh, it's the biggest problem with mosaics is background, and um, having the software try to figure out what the background of the entire image should be based on a bunch of images that all have different backgrounds.
that's I guess the simplest way I can try to explain it. Well, so Mark, before we leave that, I have one more question about the bottom of that um, mosaic planner. Since these projects take weeks and maybe years to complete, um, when you when you say write data to file, that's your 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 plan there is going to be stored so you can come back to it. Right. You can tell it what the name of the object is and then uh, tell it where you want to save the file to. And it'll write it'll write uh, all this stuff out there. That, so you can enter it into Nina or SG Pro or whatever it is you're using to, to yeah. set up your separate targets. Got it. Thanks. I don't know if there's an automated way of doing that other than typing all those all that stuff in. I mean, it, it looks like a lot, but if you're if you're down to a, a, a two by two that's just four targets, you got to type in. So, not too bad. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I actually use this for just planning individual images. If I'm not a hundred percent sure of, you know, just from looking at my planetarium program, I'm not a hundred percent sure of exactly what's out there and what I'm going to be taking a picture of. I'll go out and find a a wider field image of the same area out on Astro Bin, pull it in here and just do it as a, a one by one and and work on my framing and make sure that I've got it centered where I want and then write down these coordinates for what the center point is and of of the image. Got it. So yeah, the coordinates are obviously the center point of your framing. Right, right. And those are the numbers you need to enter into Nina or whatever, you know. And I I just, planning on a high quality image that you know has got everything in it that you want to take a picture of huh. is the big benefit to it. Rather than relying on whatever it is, Starlarium or whatever program you're using to do planning happens to throw up in front of you and and i mean with the stuff that joe and i've been doing down in, in 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 new mexico like trying to frame an ldn you know it's like you can't even see it in stellarium or in in most of those images so i mean you got to go out and find somebody that took a wide field image of that ldn pull it in here so that you can get it framed up to be exactly what you want to take an image of to do it right, to do it the right way, to 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 know what you should you expect to see when you look at the images you took with your scope. Well, that kind of bags a good question there. Can you can you go back to the last slide where you had the two by twos? Yeah. So that center part where you have the overlap of four separate images. So that center part, in the center of the two by twos, you have that little rectangle, right, which right. represents the data from all four images. Right. I realize that's a corner. Okay. So the corners are going to probably be more prone to aberrations, but doesn't that give you a higher resolution in the center of the four images than the individual corners of the four images? No, because you're not. You're not. You're not. When 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 it's creating the mosaic. It's not doing like an integration, like what image integration does. So you're not stack. You're not able to stack those corners. No, right. And and so the the, the question was, so what if you had a, a a tighter framing? So let's say that corner represented half of the four images. Could you separate out? You know, it's kind of like you get you get you get this mosaic of a wide field, and yet you still have data from which you can you can manipulate separately by stacking those corners to get a higher resolution, a higher quality image out of your four individuals. You see what I mean, I'm just, saying? Just in this, just in this little center area. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, if you wanted to do that, make the overlap a hundred percent. Well, then you, then you well, just, won't allow you to do that, but, but let's say if I made the overlap 50%, right. You right. Know, you're just making that area bigger. Uh, exactly. I see what you're saying, but why don't you just take four separate sets of exposures of the one area that you're interested in? Well, and but that goes to your your problem of the LDNs and trying to get your framing set up. 
as long as you've got this data to find out how you want your final framing to be, you still have good data there that gives you a wide field. And then typically like in a magazine, you'll see this wide field image and then you'll see this little zoom box out of the zoom of the center. And it just oh, it's to me I like see, you've got I see what you're saying. data there that is kind of going kind of like through. putting a putting a really high res image in the center of yeah. another image that's less right as it res. That's right. Yeah. And and especially like the LDNs, once you get your four by four or your two by two, you got a pretty nice image showing other people or how to get that, you know, where you want you to get your framing. And you've got this image that's worth publishing on its own. Yeah. That's all I was kind of wondering about. You just went into graduate school from what I'm trying to talk about, oh, I think. <laughs> I, I, it's an interesting idea. It's a great idea, but I... Yeah, can I just, I'm, you know, you talk about mosaics, I'm thinking right? where, where you could maybe somehow go in and crop those four corners from those images. And you'd have to crop them from... Yeah. The You'd have to crop them from, like, the, the, the raw frames, the raw subs... And right. then somehow run those through pre-processing and create a stack of yeah. those cropped corners. That sounds like it might be a lot of work. I don't know. It, it sounded to me like it was just a, a, a hybrid of, you know, it's a combination of two processes. You got, yeah. you got a set of subs that you do a lot of processing on. Well, these four represent the subs, you know? So yeah. I just, anyway, I just. When you get to the point where you're, uh, I see what you're saying. I, I'm going to go ahead and jump out of this sure. uh, interface. When you get to the point where you're actually creating the mosaic, um, you've already done all your pre-processing and you're just trying to merge the resulting images together. Uh, and so what you're talking about would have to be something that you do even before pre-processing. Okay. Um, so let me just move on to uh, the... I was I really wasn't expecting that many questions about the planning part of it, but it was interesting. Uh, yeah, you guys are you no know way too much stuff. That's the problem. Well, the plan the planning's kind of the one of the biggest parts of it, to be honest with you, because if you don't plan it well and you go to put it together, it's just not going to work. Right. So it's really important to get that stuff down. Uh, and, and that's why I started off with it, because originally I was just going to talk about the actual process of crunching through and generating a mosaic. But then and the more I thought about it, it's like, you know, planning so that you get the right images to start with is just as important, if not more important than merging them together after you process them. So, so uh, let me go through and walk, <clears throat> walk through the process that, and, and, and like I say, Joe and I have done. 10 or 15 mosaics uh, with images we've gotten. Most of them were just two by twos. Um, and running through this process, that was really easy to use uh, and generated what I thought was really good uh, images. And I'll show some examples of that later. Um, so what you start off with is, and this is just for a two by two mosaic, uh, two frames, that you want to mosaic together and you run them, of course you've run them through pre-processing and these two images that you're looking at are screen stretched. Okay. They're still linear. And the only thing I've done on them so far is I ran blur exterminator and uh, uh, SPCC color calibration on them. And so that's just, you know, the, the raw linear images with the proper color calibration and blur exterminator run on. And you can tell there's some kind of subtle background differences. It's a little greenish and down in here where it's not so much greenish up over here. Uh, so we're going to see what the mosaic software does with those. So the steps to doing a mosaic with, with the set of processes that are referenced in that Word document you start off with uh, a script called Mosaic by Coordinates. And let me clear that out. This is a lot. You can either use 
windows, in other words, image windows that you already have open, or you can do it with files. I like to do it with windows um, just because it, it, it creates, if you do it with files, it creates your output files in a separate folder. And these files that it creates are just kind of intermediate files anyhow that are pretty easy to regenerate. So uh, I, I usually just do it with Windows. So I'm gonna add the these two images to it. And those are the two images I want it to register to each other. Now, uh, I ne have never changed any of the values in all these options. If you look at it, if you have problems, if you have problems registering the images together, there's maybe some things you could do in here. Uh, Adam Block's tutorial on this goes a lot more detail of what all these settings do for you. I haven't had to do any of them. So uh, at this point, all I do is just, and, and uh, let me back up a second. These scripts will only do two images at a time. So if you did have like a two by two set of frames that you wanted to mosaic, you would have to mosaic the two on one side, separately mosaic the two on the other side, and then mosaic those two mosaics together. It'll only do them in pairs. And if you had like a, a two by three, you know, have to do it three three of them and 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 end up putting two of those three together and then merging it in with the third one. So this process only works on two images at a time. It doesn't work on all like all four images at once of a, a two by two. So I'm just going to click OK. Uh, I'm running this on a pretty fast computer. And it generates the two images that it will now will end up mosaicing together, okay? And if you lay them on top of each other, you can see where they overlap and uh, what your resulting mosaic will look like. Um, the next step in the process, the, the script wants you to do something called trim mosaic tile. And what it does, what that means is that it depends on, on what your edges of your images look like. But a lot of times these images, especially since they've been rotated, the edges will be kind of rough. Uh, sometimes your raw images, the edges won't look quite as good as the center of the image does. And it wants you just to trim off chunks of the image that don't look good. What I usually do is um, you, you pick which image you want to trim. Whoops. And what I usually do is I trim 10 pixels off of any area where the, where they, they overlap. So like in this image, the F2 image, the top, the left, and the right sides will all be part of the overlap. The bottom won't. So I'm going to trim 10 pixels off the top, the left, and the right, and only five off the bottom. And you just hit run, and it, it does it. It's hard to see it on here, but it's done it on that image. So you go pick your other image. And, and these images with the underscore RA at the end are the images that the mosaic by coordinates created. So this one, I want to trim 10 off the left, the bottom, and the right, and only five off the top. So I just go in and change those values. So it'll trim five off the top and 10 off the other sides and do run. And so now both of these images now have been trimmed and they're ready to go into the final step. Uh, the final step is called photometric mosaic. Uh, and it only runs on views. And you basically pick the two views you want. And again, you pick the ones that have the dash RA at the end of them because those are the ones that have been 
run through mosaic by coordinates and through the trimming process. Again, there's a whole bunch of options in, in here that you can use. And these are the kind of options that you can use if you have problems with gradients. And I, I haven't done much with any of those options. Uh, I th This would be a two hour long tutorial probably if I tried to walk through what all the various different settings for them were. Uh, look at that atom block uh, uh, tutorial. Plus, there's a whole raft of documentation that's available from this guy's website uh, that generated this um, that tells you what all those things are. For the most part, I haven't had to change any of those. So I just put the two images in that I want to use and hit run. This is the part that's kind of slow. Um, I'm just going to let it run. It'll probably take two or three minutes. Uh, I'm running this on a Intel i9 uh, 14900K processor with uh, 64 gig of memory and uh, very fast M.2 hard drives. Uh, it would probably be much slower on a standard desktop computer. But we'll give it a couple of minutes. Uh, Uh, this the workflow that I'm going through is in that Word document. Uh, there's not a lot of detail in them other than what I've just talked about here in terms of uh, how to run the mosaic by coordinates, trim mosaic tile, and photometric mosaic. Um, uh, talks about whether you want to run them from using open file windows as your inputs or where you want to run files through it. Again, all this, all this stuff that it's creating while it's doing all this stuff are just intermediate files that I'm not all that interested in saving anyhow. Um, so I usually just run them all on, run it all on open, open images that I've already got in there. And I only save the uh, final resulting mosaic image that it generates. So it's just about done. Mark, this, you're, this, you're giving an example uh, where we used a single filter and you're combining the the different frames uh, from that filter. Uh, I don't recall whether you've done any where you had uh, like the, the dual HA uh, filter also. Would you propose that the best way to do that is to to mosaic together all of the subframes from one filter at a time and then combine them like if you were doing RGB uh, or in our case, the, the luminance and uh, the dual filters, you, you'd build those mosaics separately and then combine them at the last step? Um, if, if I was doing LRGBs, I would uh, run all the, of course, run all the frames through weighted batch pre-processing. And then I would, for the two different frames, and then I would create uh, separate, I, I would do the RGB combination on the RGBs and create a mosaic, an RGB mosaic. And then I would create a luminance mosaic, and then I would create an HA mosaic, and then register those three mosaics against each other, crop them as necessary, and and then do your normal processing with them, okay? Because that's how you process. When you process, let's say LRGB HA, the first thing you do is is combine the RGBs into a single image, and so you've got three separate images. Basically, you're processing the the luminance, the RGB, and whatever narrow band you might have had. And so the point is to get to that those three images as mosaics and then run your process, your normal processing set on that. Um, the answer for us, and, and this, the mosaic is finished now. Um, 
this is what it looks like. Ignore that red band because that red band is just a mask. But let's zoom in on it a little bit. That red band is only there because it's a mask. So if I get rid of the mask, or let's say if I hide the mask, whoops, hide the mask. That's the join area. And I mean, if you look at across that image, it's really, really hard to tell that it joined anything together across there. And if you scroll down, again, it, it's, it does a really good job if your images, if your original images are, are pretty good quality to generate a mosaic. And it even took care of that, you know, a little bit of extra green engine-ish that, that one image had down here and a little bit less up there. That's not near as prominent in this as the other ones were. I mean, I think that's a pretty good job for creating the mosaic. Again, I think the image, the image, the initial images that we're using were pretty high quality, um, but uh, it worked really well, and it worked way better than the the built-in gradient merge mosaic would have ever done with that many stars in it. Now, an answer to what Joe, kind of what Joe said is is this was taken with a, a color camera, with an OSC camera, with uh, I called those initial images looms because we use, a, it's a UVIR filter, but it's the same thing as a luminance filter for mono to shoot that set of images. We also have uh, what we call a dual band image, a dual band filter, which is a, a HA03. And these are the two frames that I shot with that. And so to process those, I would create a separate mosaic of these two dual band images, just like I did over here. You end up having to crop them um, and then register them against, uh, you'd have to end up registering them against each other and then cropping them to get a single common area. But then from that point on, you just process them the way you would as if they were to single images and and not mosaics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Built, built, essentially, build it by filter. You build it by filter. Yeah. Or 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 except for LRGBs. I mean, I the way I do LRGBs, maybe it's not the right thing. I don't know. Is I always start off by combining the uh, not even running blur exterminator or anything on it. Just doing the 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 stacked red, green, and blue images out of batch pre-processing and running them through RGB combine to create a single RGB from those. Uh, maybe some people do like a linear fit or something like that on, on them before they do that. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, mostly what you do with LRGBs is you create an RGB image, you create a, you've got a luminance image and you got a narrow band maybe, and you do all the processing steps for those three. And so this really is just for the mosaicing is creating mosaics of those same things before you go through and do all your regular processing with them. Okay. And so this is a linear image, hasn't been stretched. The only thing that's had run on it is Blur Exterminator and, and SPCC. And so it's as if we had taken a single image of that frame and when i get done doing the same thing with the dual bands i'll end up with a single image you know that's of the same area that's just the dual band source data instead of the rgb source data and i and then i just i you have to you notice since it's cropped and everything you do have to take the two mosaics run them through um, image registration and just do a simple star alignment on them and then do a crop to get a common area between the two images. But then from that point on, uh, you just do your normal processing with them, whatever you do with 
the separate ones before you combine them or whatever. And so, I mean, those are the tools. I really didn't want to go too much further than that because anything else is just the same old stuff that you normally do. I mean, I can run through and do the mosaic process on these two. You start off with mosaic by coordinates, add those two windows, F1 and F2 dual. Okay. Give it the okay. It'll create our two. Mosaic frames, you run uh, trim on those. Again, on the, again, you got to pick the RA one, F1 RA. So I'm going to trim the top by five, left, bottom, and right by 10 on that one. So, and then I pick frame two dual with the little RA on the end of it. And this one, I want to do the top by 10. In the bottom by five. Okay. And then you just do the same thing. Uh, photometric mosaic. Pick the F1 dual RA and you have two dual RA. And run it. And give it, give it the two or three minutes that it, it needs. And it'll create a... Uh, dual mosaic like it did for the RGB and then uh, you have to register them against each other uh, crop them and then generally probably run a plate solve against both of them because a lot of the Pix Insight processes like to have a plate solved image instead of just the, the unsolved one So let me just, uh, this is SH2126. And this is the final result of all the processing on those mosaics. It's the stars and the most of the nebulosity is from the RGB. I added in some of the uh, red channel from the dual band as HA into it to enhance the red part of it. But this is that image, fully processed. Um, strangely enough, when Dan and I were talking about doing this, he gave me some data from Telescope Live that turns out it wasn't nearly as good as the data that I had, but that is a mosaic using the data that it gave us from Telescope Live. So the same thing. It's a little bit wider shot. So there's the mosaic of from the dual band. And again, these two combined ended up looking like that. That that little uh kind of IFN type nebulosity came from mostly from the RGB and the the most of the HA came from the dual band. But it processed out pretty well. There's a lot of detail in it. And I I would challenge anybody to see if they could pixel peek on this image and find any trace whatsoever of where those two images were joined. And that would not be true if you use the built-in PixInsight tools, I don't think. So, 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 Mark, do you think that would also not be true if, if you had um, been lazy like me and skipped over the trim 
mosaic. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you what. When you run when you run photometric mosaic, it knows um, whether you trimmed them or not. Okay. Well, and if you if you put two images in here you haven't trimmed and hit run, it'll say you haven't trimmed those images. And you can tell it, well, just ignore that and go on. Uh, but I do it anyhow. It it recommends doing it. It, I don't know. Once you do it often enough, it takes thirty seconds to do. So, yeah, you always want to trim because the edges are always where you have the stacking artifacts. So you definitely anywhere where it it, it meets up with the other image, you definitely want to trim it. And on these, you know, at least three sides that you're always going to want to trim just to get rid of those stacking artifacts that are there when you dither and when you point at it in different times, you're you're always going to have artifacts on the edges. Right. So, so pretty good, pretty good chance if you uh, forgot that step, you're going to end up with a, a line in your final uh, merged image, mosaic images or, or something you might detect. Like. It it depends. It'll probably you, you're much more likely to get artifacts if you don't trim. I think than if you do. Okay, thanks. I don't know. I always trim, so I haven't had a problem with it. So I can tell you from my experiences, I always trim, and they always work. So <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, if you just think about it, when you stack an image. If you have 20 images, they're all over the place. So some of those edges might only have five of them stacked together to make that row of pixels and things like that. You know, so and it definitely makes a huge difference when you're doing the mosaics because it's trying to combine them. So it it, it it's just definitely something you want to do. Yeah, yeah. I and, and and I mean, if you're just doing it with individual images, all those artifacts are on the edges of your image, and you're going to crop it out anyhow. In the mosaic, all those things show up in the dead center of your image because it's part of the overlap. All those edge problems that you get with stacking, I guess. So I just wanted to show you some of the images that Dan mentioned uh, looking for California. California and I see you're an NGC. NGC uh, seven. Or fourteen something, fourteen ninety nine, or something like that. Seven thousand, maybe. Oh no, there it is. Yeah, fourteen ninety nine. Fourteen ninety nine. Okay. Okay. This is just the the one I posted. That's got a, but that's a mosaic. I mean, I would challenge any of you to look at that image and peek in at it to see whether that's a top and bottom mosaic. Um. This one is a side-by-side uh, -side mosaic. And this one is actually a three-panel side-by-side-by-side -side mosaic of the Virgo cluster galaxies with various Messier and NGC ones tossed in there. So... Nice. I mean, if you've got good data and it comes out, they come out looking pretty good, I think. Yeah, I'll tell you how things have changed. When I did my California mosaic, once I had finally collected the four panels, um, I didn't know anything about PixInsight at the time and the tools were kind of rudimentary. So I sent my image to Ron Breacher, 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 AstroDoc, and he spent about three hours putting it together. But at the same time, I was on a trip going down to New Mexico with Greg Rupel, who's on here. And he looked at it and said, oh, you know, Maxim has a tool in it. And he took about 10 minutes and put it into Maxim. And out it spit this 
mosaic image, and that's the one I ended up using. But uh, the tools on PixInsight are so good now that uh, anyone, I, I just recommend people using PixInsight. Um, I mean, there's at least three tools in there that, do, that that can do it now, and they all handle gradients and different things. I mean, you can spend as much time as you want on it, and uh, you know, or as little time as you want. There's a tool in PixInsight that'll do it for you. And and as as far as gradients go, I would recommend if you were going to try this, I'd start out simple, doing a you know like a two by two or something. Um, you know, something like M42 or something even maybe, or not a two by two, just a side by side two frame mosaic or something like M42 or something that was nice and bright. Um, and I would run it all the way through the point to where you got the, the mosaic uh, without doing anything about gradients. And if you got to this stage here where you've actually got your mosaics created and you look at it in the, in the gradient is just, is is still obvious or you don't like it i would go back then to your original images and start doing some trying to do some gradient removal on that i mean the problem that you run into with trying to take the gradients out of your original images is doing it the same on every image and getting even backgrounds from every one of those images. The gradient removal tools are not designed to match backgrounds from one image to another. They're designed to remove the gradient from one image at a time. And so I, I, I would be very gentle with gradient removal if you decided, I mean, if, if it was so bad that you couldn't stand it in the mosaic, I would go back to the original stacked images and, and very gently try to do some gradient removal on those and try again. More than likely, I, I mean, it, it's that that becomes more of an art than a science. And you just got to kind of have to bounce back and forth and see how much gradient removal actually improves the resulting mosaic and 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 how much good it does. Yeah, I think your biggest issues with mosaics are going to be gradients. Um, can't stress that enough. So you're you're, it, it's much easier if you can get to capture these under dark skies or, you know, especially when the moon's not in the sky. Uh, there are other tools in the past that you the other challenge used to be that you wanted a flat field across your whole, your whole image field of view. And that that could have been that could that was a bit of a challenge at times with certain telescopes, and that would cause issues with with uh, mosaics because down in the corner you might have stars that aren't round and things like that, and then you try to put them together, and you get weird results. But if you have if you can't get your optical field or your image flat now, you can use tools like Blur Exterminator, which will flatten them out and makes it immensely easier to do. But uh, the 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 mosaic, the uh, gradients are still the biggest issue you, that you're going to run into. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to uh, send me a Send me a question or put a message out right. on the groups.io or something like that. I, I intentionally didn't put a lot of detail in that workflow uh, just because, you know, it's, it, you're, you're turning it into a graduate course in image processing uh, if I did that. And so um, I, I think you, if you, if you want to try it, the best, uh, the best way is to gain some experience with it, try it, and see how it works. Hey, 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 Mark. Before um, you know, you get uh stop. I I just had more like a general question um uh, about um declination, and maybe you run across this and wondering are there limitations to the software um or anything else that makes it 
hard or impossible to do do uh, mosaics, say at, at a near the pole, near the higher declinations. Is that kind of really is that going to be an issue, or just? I think that probably is going to feed into the mosaic geometry that you choose here in the mosaic by coordinates part or in the photometric mosaic. I think photometric mosaic really is more about, about the uh, gradients than it is about the geometry. So I think it's probably in that first tool where you would have to make choices like that. It's, it's, it's got to do with what's the projection you want to use, you know, okay. uh, to create your image. And I, that's a subject I'm not familiar enough with to be able to give you a definitive answer, but. That's, 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 that's a good, that's a good thing to uh, think about because as far as the stars are concerned, they don't care north, south, east, or west. It's when we start applying the, the like you say, Mark, the geometry to it, and call one star zero, and then ninety degrees away, you call that another star ninety. The math to orient that gets a little hairy around the poles. So if you're going to shoot like Polaris, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I was going to say Polaris. if you pulled an image of Polaris and ran it into that tool, it'd be interesting to see how the uh, yeah. how the uh, how it how it maps it out. It, it would right. be interesting. Well, speaking of Polaris, I remember a story from back in the early days of ballistic missiles where yeah, yeah, they did well. they didn't they couldn't fly them over the North Pole because the navigation would get all scrambled for exactly the reasons we're talking about. Yep. So at some point, you might just have to kind you know it would be like, can you turn off the math and just have it locate what appears to be similar stars and then stretch the pixels, you know, the pixel geometry to get to that without having to go through the math. Well, yeah, but you know, it'd be an easy, relatively sort of just experiment to do, you know. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Just you know, but I, I, I haven't done any mosaics. I'm going to start with something simple first, yeah. like Mark said. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, Mer Mer if you look at if you look at the options in mosaic by coordinates for what projection you can use, there's a lot of different uh, options yeah. in here, and Mercator is the standard. Uh, what is it? Equal areas or equal. Yeah. Well, equal azimuth projection, you know, this is not this is not a, a new problem. This has been around for hundreds of years of people trying to put make flat maps from around Earth, you know. And so there's lots of different. I'm sure there's. Yeah. Yeah. Peel in the orange. For for doing that. And I, I suspect it's probably not too hard. You just have to know which option to pick. Yeah. Yeah. I would also say that I would also say that the wider you make your oh, yeah. uh, your uh, mosaic, the more chance that the mosaic is going to curve a little bit uh, when it get, finally gets put together. And when it does, then you'll have black areas. I mean, if you don't if you don't crop it, you'll have black areas around the edges with that curve. I mean, you can kind of see that the way this this uh, um, tool builds the you know the the over the overlays and if you get too wide and it's too curved then when you crop it you're just losing more and more of the interesting part of your design so i think that's also something that you have to think about is not making too wide you know two a one by two is probably fine but you start to get too much farther out and now you're to, to make it look good at the end you've got to crop so much of it you lose too much of the interesting information so Joe, would that be like uh, your your resulting mosaic shouldn't be greater than uh, 20, 30, 40 degree field of view? I don't have a, I don't have way. a formula, you know, from experience. I know that I know I did way back uh, before my, with my first telescope out there. I did a nine by nine, and I know oh. that the that the thing curved out quite a bit, so right. that I had to cut the corners off, and pretty soon I've lost you know some of the central interesting parts. The central parts from an edge crop? No, I'm, I'm just saying the object was large enough that when it when it curved out to the oh. edges, when I cropped it square or rectangular, I was starting to cut into the things I was interested in. Okay. Preserving. 
So what was the field of view of your individual nine images? I don't remember. It was my, it was with my refractor, but I don't think I had, I think I used more like a 10% overlap. So, you know, when you get three out, you're starting to see some of that curvature develop. Huh. I didn't have a, a, a three by three with your refractor was probably at least seven or eight degrees across, I would think, in the long axis. Yeah, it could be in that neighborhood getting there. So that's not especially, especially with the smaller overlap that I used on that one. Oh, I wonder if that's a function of your optics. No, I mean, just go back and look at, at the tutorial, just what Mark showed us. You can see that in oh. order to line it up, you can see the rectangle starting to curve uh, around the, you know, the declination line. So you get too far out. And if you're, you're trying to, if your margins on the edges are not that great, then at some point that curve is going to, to make it rectangular again, you're going to cut things out. And that, and that oh, just. I got gotcha. you. So yeah. the, the question. Well, is I mean, the, I think the Mercator projection yeah. that this is using is trying to make your RA and deck lines be orthogonal everywhere. Yeah. And it's it's warping everything so that your RA and deck lines are orthogonal. There's other projections that will allow your RA and deck lines to be curved and would start addressing the kind of things that Joe is talking about. That's yeah. what all those that's what all those other projections are in there for is is what shape do I want your result? My RA and deck lines to take to make this mosaic look like it looks when I look up in the sky and my eye doesn't care about what RA and deck it's looking at. You know. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's exactly what was going on. As soon as Joe described it, I was like, oh, that's in a software. That's in the math, not in the optics. Well, I mean, you're right. Yeah. Camera out and take a close-up picture of a, a globe of the earth. Yeah. And the the Latin long lines are curved when you that's do right. that. yeah. And that's just that's you're taking a flat projection of a round object. So you're right, it's in the math. There you go, Joe. Reprocess that thing and see what you can do with it. <laughs> yeah, what what happens about ninety nine percent of the time is after the the people take the, all those images, they find they have all those holes in it, yeah. and then they have to go back out and they take images to fill the holes. Yeah, at some point you're pulling your hair out because it's so complicated. Yeah. Hey Dan, this is Tally. You're recording this, correct? And is for those of us who aren't smart enough to convert Central Time to Mountain Time, I missed the start of this. So. Are you going to post this where I can go back and see the start? Yes, I will. And I'll post links to the data and the ancillary stuff that goes with it. So Great. Thanks, Dan. No problem. Yeah, so you can go through with these same images and follow through step by step with what I just did. So to get to this point here. Thank you, Mark. Like I say, you guys are way too smart. You, you, you are, you guys are so hard to give a presentation to because your questions are too darn smart. And then Mark, this is telling you one other thing. Have you turned on using your graphics processor for Pix Insight? Yes. Okay, because we found on some of these different things went it's to seconds. I I don't think I don't think any of this stuff that I've looked at uses the GPU. Uh, okay, gotcha. I, mean, I, I can let I'll tell you what, I, let me do something real quick with it. Let me do that film mosaic over again. And while it's running, I can look at the GPU. Yeah, I don't think any of that stuff will use it. And if it was using the GPU, this CUDA line here would be showing some usage in it. And so it's not. It's not even using that much GPU, C, CPU, really. Huh. So yeah, good it, it, must, it, must, it must be kind of like not even have a whole lot of threads to it because this is a, a Intel i9. So it's only using a third of the available processors. Um, and so it's it's not even multi-threaded much. But it's still cranking on the images though, right? 
but it's still cranking on the images. But I mean, like when I use weighted, if I do weighted batch pre-processing, the CPU goes to 100%, but that means it's using, uh, yeah, it's using, you know, every CPU, every one of those CPUs, and there's 24 of them uh, available on my machine. This one's not using all of those. So, but yeah, any of the, any of the things that use the GPU, like if I run Blur Exterminator or Star Exterminator, this CUDA graph goes up to like 90%. And that's where I'm getting all that benefit from is when it's using the CUDA processing cores. So the question, and I haven't pecked, I haven't stayed current with processors. If it's still processing your images and it's and it's been like 30 seconds to a minute, um, I, I guess it's doing it in a serial process where it doesn't, it can't use multi-threads and GPUs to speed the process up? It's all in the way the software is written. I, I assume that there's some, there's probably some kinds of, processing some sort of, sorts of math that don't lend themselves well to multi-threading and others that do. Obviously, GPU, yeah. obviously weighted batch pre-processing is highly multi-threaded because it does, does the same thing over and over again for every one of your frames. Um, you know, other things like this might not be easily multi-threaded. I don't know. Yeah. It's got to do with, with the the math behind the process that it's running. I was just kind of curious because you you got a you got a great machine there, tons of processors, a GPU, tons of memory, and it's not using hardly any of that, and it's still taking like a minute, minute and a half to process. You know, uh, on on my machine, I got like one processor, thirty two gig. <laughs> I don't well, this one is. I mean, if it's using thirty percent, it's still using eight processors at five gigahertz each, so it's still running. Okay fast uh a lot faster than uh it but i mean if you had another machine with eight processors and it used all of those the only difference in speed would be whatever the the core speed was and you might be three gigahertz instead of five gigahertz and okay. so you know yeah. it might be 60 percent slower or something i don't know yeah Jeez. If you, anything that can run on those CUDA processors is fast, is really fast. <laughs> and the more CUDA cores you can get on your graphics card, the better off you are. Okay, so I will stop sharing at this point and turn it back to Dan. Anyone, any other questions for Mark on the Mosaic stuff? Really appreciate. Okay, it. I would encourage you to try it at least on something simple in a place. If you you know as dark an area as you can get on as moonless a night as you can get, and try to do something really that's really bright, uh, and see what happens. It's 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 not impossible. And and these tools are so much better than they used to be that you know it might work. I, that that data that Dan gave me from uh, Telescope Live. I was really surprised. It was really crappy and had a lot of gradients. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was RGB data and it had a lot of vignetting in it. And it, it, it was, um, um, each of the color filters had different vignetting in it. So when you combine the three, the R, G, and B into a single image, you had like color fringes around the edges of the image. And like that became part of the overlap. And the tool still got rid of most of that, uh, which I was really surprised at. I thought it was just going to look like crap when it got done, but it actually didn't look all that bad. Mark's being nice. He did a lot of work to get that image in because I, I stacked those to give to him. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, I just wasted two hours of my life. <laughs> and uh, so... Yeah. So you think that that version of it that I just showed of the mosaic of those live telescope ones that I I'm surprised it turned out as good as it did. 
Yeah, I thought it looked really good compared with what I saw when after I stacked them. Um, yeah, you know, uh, sorry guys. I uh, didn't realize how bad that data was until I stacked them for Mark and I, I thought I was doing a good thing by getting some data that I could give to everyone, but they tend to run their telescopes as anytime it's clear and I'm I don't know, maybe I'm I'm lazy. I don't take images when the when the moon's an issue and things like that. And they they do. And so I don't tend to run into gradients and stuff as much. And their their images were really poor with these. And uh let me let me share my screen. Yeah, uh, they're flat field on it, it's not very good. And uh they've got these TAC telescopes that are really, really expensive telescopes, but they don't cover the full chip. Oh. And uh, that's one of the two frames of what Dan sent me from Telescope Live. And you can see all the color variations in the vignetting. I couldn't believe it. I mean, those were calibrated frames and they still had vignetting in them, right? Yeah. yeah. That was weird. And well, and so there was another there was another image that was above this that, that got or stacked. And I thought all this stuff would just blow out the mosaic process and it actually ended up looking pretty good well, well that's in, that's encouraging mark because i uh I, I i get telescope live data as well you know and it's oh it's calibrated but i didn't even think about the gradient issues and i i downloaded some recently from uh that uh of andromeda galaxy and uh it's all over the place you know as far as vignetting like you're seeing and and other stuff so i'm hoping Open Pix Insight can help me sort all that out because, you know, Andromeda is such a wide field of view. That that'd be a good mosaic target for for my uh my particular telescope too. I can't get it yeah. all in. I can't get it all in one uh, one well, shot. I, I just don't understand why there's still vignetting in it. That's why isn't that taken out by the flats? I don't understand that. Uh, yeah, four, they they have flats. some they have some weird issues with their calibration stuff. I, I'm. They've never really given me a direct answer on it because me and some of the other people complained a lot. And I'm not sure what the issue there is. They, they claim, the last claim was that um, those tax scopes fully illuminated the 1600 cameras that they used because they were, they were square instead of rectangular. Um, and now they're using the... Uh, the 60, they're, they're using the QHY version of the 6200 camera. It's got the same chip and it's uh, rectangular versus square. But I would still think that the uh, the flat should take it out. But um, I think they have some kind of issues with their uh, pipeline uh, with the data. And it seems to uh, it also seems to be worse when when they're taking the images with the moon up versus when it's down too. Um, so I, I I I I tend not to grab or I wouldn't pay for the the data off their uh, their wide field scopes the the SPA one SPA three uh, AUS two. Or AUS, the the same version from Australia. Those are the challenging ones. Um, the the other scopes are much better. But yeah, that, as you can see, you saw what Mark got out of that image and how bad it looked to start. So the, it is salvageable, but it, I'm sure it took a lot of work. Well, well, I yeah, I, I have a bunch of uh, Andromeda images from the SPA1 uh, refractor. Uh, I'll see what comes out. The, the good thing about that one is, is it's so wide on M31 that you can definitely crop a lot of it out and still have a really good image. And you probably have so many, so many, they take so many images of it that you have, you get such good data because you stack so many of them. And like I said, you can crop out all the other stuff and still have full Andromeda in it. Yeah, it, it looks like that's the case here. And um, I'll end up cropping out and still have much better than I would have got, you know, I have more galaxy than I would have with my 500 millimeter focal length. So 
Yeah. And small and small sensor, relatively small sensor. Well, we appreciate it, Mark. I know there were several people that were very interested in it. Um, there's some people on here that do have Telescope Live. Um, Adam gave a really good presentation too on the uh, the newest Mosaic script. They have a, a video on their site that you can access if, if you're a Telescope Live member. That's really good too, where he actually goes through some of the the mosaic thing, some of the gradient things and things like that. It was way beyond me, uh, but he does go through pretty much every box. Uh, it might be similar to the one that he has on his Adam Block Studio site. I, I, I can't see that one. Well, I mean, I think if you're looking at a, if you're looking for a tutorial, look for one that, that, that uses the tools that I just showed not the ones that use the, the gradient merge mosaic tool that's built in the PixInsight because I, to me, the two, those two are like using a deconvolution versus blur exterminator Yeah. in terms of the amount of work that it takes. Well, so one, one other thing I, I noticed I, um, about the, those tools in PixInsight, I, I do, I did, um, Download the latest build a couple of days ago on Pix and Site. And sure enough, um, some of those mosaic tools are not there. Um, so I'm gonna have to, like Mark said, go to the website that he cited and download those uh, extra goodies that you need. The only ones I have are mosaic by coordinates and mosaic planner. I guess those come with the the updates, but not not the other parts. The the guy who developed the the um, photometric mosaic and trim mosaic asked the PixInsight people to not distribute his stuff with the standard distribution, and so the only way you can get it now is as a uh, resources through linking to his website. I yeah, don't that, okay. Thanks, thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Um, one of the suggestions that uh, Greg Ruppel made was that with his group in Tucson, he, he they've been talking about groups of ob objects to image. Um, it's something we did in the past, but it's been a long time. And if you see all my images, I tend to post oddball things uh, because I've taken so many pictures. And so there's a lot of groups of objects that that aren't, they're kind of off the beaten, on the beaten path, so to speak. And so I'm gonna try my best to talk about some group about every meeting or every other meeting. Uh, I know group, Greg's on here. We've talked about maybe doing, he has a good presentation on art galaxies that we'll probably give in a future meeting. Uh, but tonight I had something already put together on sharpless objects. At one time, uh, I proposed a astronomy league sharpless program. Um, it wasn't approved because they already had something called the bright nebula, but, uh, I'm a big fan of the sharpless objects because most of them are heavy in hydrogen alpha. And so for us people in the city, every night of the year, we can shoot these kind of hydrogen alpha objects using filters. Um, doesn't matter whether it's you're in the middle of the city or the moon's out for the most part, if you have one of those filters that brings in hydrogen alpha, you can shoot the sharpless objects. Um, and for visual people, the sharpless objects are really good to look at through image intensifiers, uh, night vision equipment, Anyone that uses night vision equipment, they typically use some kind of hydrogen alpha filter. And so uh, if you've ever looked through one of those night vision monoculars and you look up at Cygnus, it lights up the sky. It's pretty amazing. But uh, for us image takers, the sharpless objects are really bright in hydrogen alpha for the most part. Just about all of them are hydrogen alpha. Um, let me share my my little blurb here real quick. Let's see here. 
your screen. Um, basically, um, uh, Stuart Sharpless, he was a, a astronomer and he made a catalog of the plates taken by um, a 43, uh, a, uh, ugh, the uh, Palomar Sky Atlas uh, National Geographic plates. He made a catalog that had, how many did it have? 141 objects. And then years a few years later, he was on the staff of the U.S. Navy Optical Observatory in Flagstaff. And he uh, created a new catalog of 313 objects. And that's the Sharpless II catalog that everyone references. Um, again, it has 313 objects in it. Um, most of them are in Milky Way regions, but I'll show you, I have all kinds of of documentation and things that I'm going to put out on the groups.io or at least provide an email link to. Um, but uh, these objects, like I said, they're all nebulous. Some of them are big, some of them are really small, but there's, there's a lot of big ones. And almost every night of the year, there's something up there you can image outside of uh, galaxy season coming up when, uh, you're kind of limited to galaxies. There's not a lot of hydrogen alpha stuff there. Um, but uh, let me uh, show you some. Uh, let me share a different screen. Which is your favorite uh, sharpest object, Dan? You know, I'm really not sure. I, I literally, uh, I've been imaging a bunch of them. So I, uh, sorry, I'm. Looking for the uh, the option to share again. <clears throat> Sorry, I have too many windows open. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, there, like I said, there's 313 of them. So I've imaged over 200 at this point. Um, wow. there, there's a lot of neat stuff out there, and there's a lot of neat stuff that you don't normally see. Um, there's a lot of them are also common things, like uh, I believe the, the pelican is a sharpless object. Um, I'm sure the California Nebula is probably also a shirtless object, things like that. But mm -hmm. there are so many that uh, yeah. there's a uh, there's a little bit of everything from little blobs to big, uh, you know, fill up your field of view um, on your camera size stuff. Um, if you take a picture of Orion, Bernard's. Bernard's Nebula, Bernard's Loop is a sharpless object. Um, so th there's just a lot of stuff out there. Um, I generally, I'll, I'll include all these links and things, but uh, a good place to look is um, the Sharpless Catalog site. By it, This is um, maintained by a guy named Dean Sal Salman. Um, Dean was actually from, I believe he was from Fenton. He lives out in New Mexico now, but um, he's been imaging these for a long time. I was lucky enough to meet Dean at an astronomy show once. Uh, I left the show and then someone told me he was there and so I had to go back in to, to meet him. But uh, he has all these gal galleries out there and I don't show. Wow. Um, and so he has links to the majority of the objects um, wow. and what i like about his site is he isn't he even has it by constellation so you know this time of year orion's up okay here's all the ones in orion as you can see there's just tons of them you know so if you anything go back to and everything and, and um 
he has all the information on what he's used to take it because see some of these are huge this one he took with a 105 millimeter lens and a big chip camera others are much smaller hey that's a good question would uh oh I wonder how the mosaics would work on black and white, on luminance only. Well, they, it works fine. Is it is it less complicated, or does does it matter if it's color or black and white? Well, anytime you have less less images to put together, it's less complicated. But okay. I mean, other than that, it's you know, it's it's kind of. I think it's a lot easier for narrow band because you don't have as much background and gradients to deal with. Color matching. Cause Jan, you when you do the sharpness, you're doing you're doing illuminance only or are you doing color? I'm doing color on all of them. Uh I typically I typically use a hydrogen alpha filter and then I take RGB. Uh some of these you can take with luminance, but like I said, the majority of them are hydrogen alpha rich. Um okay. of course, um when you look at his catalog, the Sharpless One has very little hard hydrogen alpha in it. It's all <laughs> reflection. Um, Just gonna ask. It, you know, one of one of the one of the problems with a lot of these off the beaten path type catalogs, like Lens Bright Nebulas and things like that, is when you look them up online, it'll say they're hydrogen two rich or hydrogen alpha rich and things like that and sometimes they don't have any um for the most part all of these were were catalogs on these kind of objects were made by looking at <coughs> plates taken by old old cameras and they just assumed that they were bright and oh. and stuff like that so there are some that i would call them you know like like when they say you find a meteor right or a meteor wrong, yeah. there are some that are sharpless wrong, so to speak. There are some that are that are little more than dust. Um, let's see here. So, hmm. oh, man, that that that's. Not... Can you do a spectrum off of an image? Well, yeah, okay, yeah, you can, but you're gonna it's gonna it could be artificially skewed due to the processing. <clears throat> well, like I said, most of these, like I said, are, are hydrogen alpha rich, and yeah. so they're really good for us imagers with hydrogen alpha filters or dual band type filters to capture any night of the year, even okay. with the moon up. And that's that was kind of my goal with the uh, with the uh, proposing the program at the time was, you know, there these are things that we can as imagers that we can target when we otherwise might not image um things like that uh, have you have you imaged uh sh2 308 Dol dolphin head nebula uh i have but that that's another one that lacks uh hydrogen yeah and Ox it's also oxygen. very low so uh okay because there's I was doing some research on that. Um there's a, a really nice another SH2 right next to it that really doesn't get a whole lot of attention. SH2 303. Man, in a wide field, those two uh, <clears throat> sharpest objects just look amazing. You said 303? Uh 30 <laughs> yep, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So the object Oh, the cloud to the left. That's uh, 303. Hmm. <clears throat> hey, did you stop recording, Dan? No, but you can't get my... Thank yeah, you. I was just... Yeah, I saw you hit it. Uh, hit. Yeah, see, I took 303. That's another one that's low, so I probably shot this from New Mexico. Yeah, and just didn't have the time to do it in hydrogen alpha. Um, but you can see how faint it is in just normal mm -hmm. colors. Mm -hmm. But it would really pop out if it was in hydrogen alpha. So you've got enough data on these things, Dan. Are, are, 
are you able, is someone able to use your data and revise like Lynn's catalog as far as the individual entities composition? Like I, you said, SH1, they list it as a lot of H alpha, but you have imaged it and found there's practically none. Do we see a Krausen revision to the Lynn's Heinz catalog? Probably not. <laughs> Well, why why not? I mean, it, well, I guess everybody knows that SH one's got nothing in it then. Yeah. Um, okay. Is this one? So the newbie who's actually referencing Lynn's catalog and thinking that it already he already knows that Lynn's can be off. Yeah. Well, not necessarily because I'll yeah. tell you, I, I the last time it was clear here in St. Louis, I was looking for something to image, so I found some Lynn's bright nebula that was placed well in the sky. I looked it up in the online catalogs in Simbad and it said hydrogen two region. Yeah. Actually what it was called. I shot like seven hours of, of HA and it didn't pick up anything but stars. And so it's like, <laughs> what was it? I mean, I don't even know. I, I don't think any, I, I think there's a lot of this nebula, nebulas and things like that that just aren't visited much. I don't think it's, uh, I, I, I don't think the scientists care as much about that stuff as they do with a lot of the galaxies and special galaxies and things like that. Mm. Um, but well. there is a, there is another um, survey that's going on with amateurs that's, that I can talk about tonight if we have time. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, okay. It's real quick. There's there's other sites. I like I said, I include all these links. There's this Galaxy Map site that has a lot of good information when you click on it, um, and it it kind of tells you well we think this one is is ionized by this certain star and here's a link to the paper talking about it and this is how far away it is. Um, and then lastly, the other site I really like that I've included is this Reiner Vogel. Oh well, yeah, I've been there. You know, some people have probably found him before. Um, he's written, he's compiled a lot of books on different objects. Um, he has one on wolf rayet stars, uh, sharpless objects, uh, uh, Hickson groups, and a, and a Bell planetaries. Um, one of the things I include, and I'll give you a link to, is his sharpless um, objects. He has a book that's over 500 pages that goes through all these sharpless objects. So it, 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 it's got a, a lot of really good information in it and it's free and the whole, you know, you can just download it. Uh, I also have some large maps that, that it doesn't make sense to show them on the Zoom, but I'm gonna include those that you can print out that shows the distribution of sharpless objects across the whole, the whole plane, so to speak. So you can look at them and, uh, and find something to image that night. Um, do recommend, you know, look out on the web, look at Dean Salmon's site or type in Flickr and my name. And I've got literally, I, I think my, uh, my, uh, oh, how do I get back? I've got 5,000 photos <laughs> there, but, uh, I have, I think, over 200 of them imaged in my uh, Sharpless al album. So there, th there's a lot of them out there. And like I said, most of them are really good for imaging when, when the moon's out or when, when the skies are bright. Hey, Dan, when, oh. when um, people uh, in astronomy say a bright nebula, is bright a technical term? In other words, is it <laughs> implying uh, that it's an HA or something like that, rather than just an adjective saying it's bright or dim? Is it I, I don't know how they define that. It, it, it seemed like 
anything that they determined was a bright nebula was something when they looked at the old photo plates off those old surveys, if they could see the dust there, it was considered bright, so to speak. But if you look at Lynn's list of, I think it's over a thousand of these objects, they list a brightness scale from like one to five. Right. One is like very yeah. It, it, one is like bright, and that's something like maybe the crescent nebula or something like that. That that isn't very bright. You know, it looks bright in images, but it tends to not be very bright. But once you get the the four or fives, they're like barely there. It's like take a bunch of images and it might show up type yeah. thing. So I don't. Yeah. It was just brighter than a background, for lack of a better <laughs> description. I think. Thanks, I've, I've Joe. Read, the way you phrase that, it, it's kind of like, boy, that guy's as bright as a bag of rocks. Yeah, I, you know, the reason I brought it up is I just read something recently where that uh, it inferred that the term bright was indicating uh, an HA uh, area. And in, in particular, in Sharpless catalog, he had a bunch of uh, you know nebula that were considered to be bright, but it turns out later they discovered they're not HA. And like, it, like you're saying, and I was just curious of whether that yeah. was sort of a a standard term of some sort that that you are aware of yeah. sounds like basically uh, yeah. an, an adjective <laughs> yeah I, I think so all right yeah if we have it only take a few minutes why don't i go through this i found this new survey that they published in the last week or so um, and it's from uh, so, one of the guys from uh, Sky and Telescope and a couple other guys that are just, they're just amateurs. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen real quick. So I put something together because I found it really interesting. Um, it's called the MDW uh, HA uh, Sky Survey. And uh, um, and it's a it, it's an all sky survey using just hydrogen alpha, um, and um, they're just using off the Astrophysics one thirty refractors, which are good refractors, but they've got the uh, the flattener on them, and they have these are old style CCD cameras, but the huge huge chip ones, so they're they're getting very wide fields of view and they're using a very narrow uh, three nanometer hydrogen alpha filter. Um, and when they decided to do this, um, you know, they they decided to, to do it in a way that they thought the data would be worthwhile for science. So they, they put a lot of uh, good practices in their, in the way they did it. Um, and um, it was, uh, it's from three guys, uh, David Middleman, I don't know who that is, but Dennis DeSico or whatever. Yeah. I know I've seen his name various places. And Sean Walker, who is one of the, I believe he's some kind of editor with Sky and Telescope. Um, and uh, that I'll, like I said, I'm gonna include all this stuff on the group site IO. So, or you know, or in the email I send out, so you don't have to click on any of these links. But I, I did put links into websites so that it gives a lot more information than I'm than I'm given. Um, and uh, this survey, which is really <laughs> huge, you, you know, we're we're talking about mosaics of four fields. Well, they're doing a survey of four thousand one hundred sixteen fields. And each one of those fields is 3.6 by 3.6 degrees. Um, so you can see this is going to take a long time. And uh, for each field, they're taking 12 20 minute exposures at full resolution. Um, and they're sampled at 3.7 arc seconds of pixels, 3.17, I should say. This is what it looks like. I mean, this this small picture doesn't do it justice, but every one of those squ squares is one of the fields. And the reds are imaged or unimaged? The, the red 
they they have actually imaged the red and the purple. So the yellow they've yet to do? The yellow is yet to do. And if you could see this image, you would notice that the yellow are all southern hemisphere yeah. light fields. And so they're working on that now and they're planning to have that done by the end of 2025. Um, hey. The red is what they call data release zero, and they've released that to the public. Um, okay. And I'm include I've in, I'll include links to that data so you can actually download that data and use it. Um, so hey Dan, is this something similar to what uh, the Euclid uh, telescope is doing? I don't know what that is. Okay. Hmm. Is that the, the European one that's? Uh, is it? Yeah, I believe it is. It's European. Um, it was launched. Was it last year? Oh, it's a spacecraft. No, no, it's like the James Webb. It's a telescope. Oh, yeah, that's. I mean, it's in space. It's not ground. Yeah, 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 space based. And um, I mean, you can look it up while we're, we're on this call. Uh, it, it. I, I mean, I'm. I've never seen this NDW before, uh, but the the mapping what I'm seeing here with the or the the red and the, the the purple seems very similar to what that's doing. And I, I I'm curious to see if they're mapping it. Are they mapping it from from space or they're map mapping it from Earth or you know? Or MDW MDW is 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 ground based. It's ground based. Okay. <clears throat> you call it Euclid? The Euclid Telescope. Interesting. Yeah. Euclid, Euclid display, spacecraft, a uh, wide angle space, uh, 600 megapixel camera, yeah. record visible light near infrared spectrometer and photometer to determine redshift of detected galaxies. So, would you call that pure imaging or is that? Just you know, doing a redshift study of detected galaxies. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I guess it's they've got so many of these large surveys going now that you can't keep up with them. But I'm assuming it, it sounds like it's taken visible and near what did it say near infrared or something? Yeah, like it says it uses a 600 megapixel camera to record visible light, a near infrared spectrometer and photometer to determine the redshift of detected galaxies. And I, I don't know what the process, it, it, you, you wonder if it's downlinking all 600 megapixel images or is it doing some kind of pre-processing and then downloading the data? I would assume that it's, it's doing something similar. All these surveys are doing the same thing. They map out fields and, and over the years, they collect massive amounts of data that's analyzed oh. later. Um, so. So it's like uh, the, the, the new, very large telescope they're building down in South America or whatever will be able to map the whole sky every other night, I believe, mm -hmm, generates mm -hmm. terabytes of data every night. That's crazy. Yeah. So, hey, uh, Grant, if you want, you can look up uh, some of the images that uh, Euclid has sent back. Uh, I, just, I was just looking at them. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. downloading, uh, yeah, like Dan says, massive amounts of data. Yeah. Those are some great looking images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. And, and pretty, the question is now how, are, how are they going to do the processing to determine redshift? Hmm. Yeah, somebody in Pix Insight. <laughs> yeah, if I got to choose it now to say. <laughs> Excuse me. I was watching, um, I think it was a PBS special about James Webb. You know, they showed, you know, how it was made and all the. The struggles and yeah. you know the the miscues, and then at the back end of the the presentation, they showed how they process their image images, and you'll never guess what tools they use. Picks insight. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, look, that's the same thing that most of us are doing right here. I'm like, oh. interesting. So they showed how they did um. I think they talked about the pillars of creation. So they kind of showed how they created the uh, Hubble palette. And 
for someone who doesn't know anything about Pixinsight, site, they'll just, you know, gloss over it and move on. But I was looking at like, hey, I, I know that process. I, I know that process. Like, oh, okay. Interesting. Just just two, I think with two or three guys in a room just sitting in front of about maybe six to, to eight computer monitors. And they're just going at it, man. Like, interesting. So, yeah, if you have PBS, you can look up. Just type in James yeah. Webb on PBS, I'm sure. You'll find the hour-long uh, 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 yeah. special that came out. There, there's a guy on, on <clears throat> net called, he's got his YouTube channel called Getting uh, Smarter Every Day. Mm -hmm. See that? He did, his dad apparently was a metrologist working on that, uh, uh, the solar shield. And okay. uh, the guy, the kid did a uh, hour long thing with his dad in the, in, in the housing where they were doing the, um, the studies on that with, with the web completely unfurled. Wow. That was really interesting. And then I come to find out that thing's kind of getting hammered by meteoroids. So it's becoming a kind of a, kind of, they didn't anticipate the number of strikes that they would get. So now it's just kind of gathering science on uh, the density of the meteoroids out there. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's what they call unintended, unintended data, unintended science. <laughs> yeah. The last thing I, I just wanted to show is, like I said, I'm going to include all the links, but you can actually go out and download all the data that they oh. have. So there, you know, if you want to play around, if you want to make mosaics, you know, things <laughs> like that, you can go out to their website and I include the links and you can download all of the data in fits in 64 bit fits format, calibrated data. You can download it with stars removed. You can, you can download anything and everything and uh, mess with it and, uh, you know, post it if you want to. And, uh, you know, as long as you cite them or whatever, they tell you how to cite them. But uh, like I said, they've, they've released a lot of fields so far, and uh, they expect to release the rest of the information or the rest of the fields over time. Okay. Um, so it, I, I found it kind of interesting because, you know, these are just three guys with a telescope, so to speak. Uh, granted, they're using, they're using higher end equipment but it's still three guys with a telescope you know taking pictures of the sky anytime it's clear and and uh they're they're also they're going beyond what we would normally do in that they're they're calibrating the the fields and stuff like that so they're doing a lot of the sciencey stuff behind the scenes so you can use the data for science work versus just making pretty pictures but like I said, they just released all this data in the past week, and mm -hmm. I expect them to, to release more. And I expect that once people start pouring through that, they're going to find hydrogen mm -hmm. alpha objects that we haven't found before. Sure. Okay, interesting. So, so I, have, I, have a, I have a question for you, Dan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is off topic. So this is regarding uh, one shot color versus mono. One of the discussions I've heard is true scientific work only supports and uses mono imaging. Is there any truth to that? I think it probably depends on what you want to do. There are certain things where when you want to know star colors and magnitudes, that the, generally that kind of stuff is relegated to individual filters uh, mapped to certain filters and things like that. And so even if you use a one, sh they'll allow you to use like, like a one shot color camera for say the uh, variable stars and the uh, AAVSO, which is the organization that handles those. And typically when people will use a one shot color camera, they'll only use like the green, channel or something like that but for the most part on that kind of stuff all the magnitudes are measured by individual by certain filters to to so everything compare I, I don't know of a good way of saying it when you compare stuff you're comparing apples to apples so to speak um, but i'm sure there are th are sciencey things that you can use one shot color cameras for okay um, i'm not 
I don't know any off the top of my head, but I don't know a lot off the top of my head for mono cameras either, other than the things I've done in the past with variable stars and okay. things Thank like you. that. Appreciate it. So let me ask you this, Dan. Um, back on MDW, okay, those three guys, is their data, is it, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to actually articulate this, but I'll be blunt. Is their data and science better than that uh, site that you and Mark were talking about where you're getting your data from the online telescope? What was the name of that place? Um, we're just using survey various surveys. There's a bunch of different ones. Um, I wouldn't say their 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 data is better or their data is not as good. I would just say that it's it's what makes their data unique is that it's hydrogen alpha only and yeah. it's very narrow with a three nanoband nanometer band filter. And that's not something you've seen on the the surveys for you know at the big observatories sure. and things like that. It's just somewhat yeah. unique. And it seems like with the astro imagers pushing everything these days with processing and stuff like that, the astro imagers are finding things in hydrogen alpha and O3, things oh, yeah. that were never that that typically weren't looked at as often by the professionals unless it was a planetary nebula they they definitely look at it with with o3 yeah. but they don't spend the time they don't have the time that we do i, I got you i what I, I guess where i was going is um uh in joe's presentation he showed an image of uh, a lot of, of an image that was highly vision edited from the on, that online telescope yeah Okay, what was that? What was that from? That what was that telescope? What was that? Oh, the, that's Telescope Live. They're a they're a, Telescope Live, right? Yeah, they're not a science. Or they, they don't. They're not selling science stuff. Okay, they're just yeah, they're just supplying data for people like you, me, people that want to make pretty pictures right. for the most part. So in that regard, those three guys are actually contributing. Uh, their goal is actually to contribute science. Yes. Right. Okay. Which and at that point is comparing apples and oranges with uh, Telescope Live. Then. Yeah. Okay. Because I was looking at their images that you were showing. I was like, those are significantly better than the image that Joe was showing from Telescope Live. I'm like, these guys are, you know, these guys are more than just. They're a step above the Telescope Live data. Yeah, it, it's just kind of a it, it's a different thing. Um, sure. yeah. You can't can't really compare the two. Uh, those guys also make pretty pictures too, but they've dedicated a telescope or telescopes to this project, yeah. and it's mainly geared towards science. Hey, anyone? Else have anything else they want to talk about? I'll talk with Miguel later. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good night.